Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next session. My name is uh, Alan Mindenhall. I'm an associate dean at Faulkner University Thomas Good Jones School of Law in Montgomery, Alabama, and executive director of the Blackstone and Burke Center for Law and Liberty. I'm uh, very happy to be uh, moderating this panel. It should be a very interesting panel. We had a, uh, a third chair here for Jonah Goldberg, but we decided to remove it because we thought an empty chair would provide just as much intellectual substance as, as, as he would. So, uh, to my immediate left is uh, Michael Anton, known to, to all of you. He is a lecturer in politics and a research fellow at Hillsdale College. He's worked in a variety of political roles, including in the Trump administration. He was educated primarily at Claremont Graduate School and the Claremont Institute in Political Philosophy and American Politics. And beside him, we have Sam Gregg, who is director of research at the Acton Institute. He has written and spoken extensively on questions of political economy, economic history, ethics and finance, and natural law theory. He has a master's in political philosophy from the University of Melbourne and a doctorate in philosophy uh, in moral philosophy and political economy from the University of Oxford. He is the author of numerous books, too many to actually uh, list here, and he publishes in a wide variety of journals, again, too many to list here. Uh, in 2001, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a member of the Mount Pelerin Society in 2004, and he became a member of this organization in 2008. So thank you both for uh, being here. The title of this panel is Liberalism, Populism, and the Future of Conservatism. Each of these categories, in my view, is uh, permeable. There's some overlaps. There have been populists on the left in the United States. Uh, Bernie Sanders is a recent example. Huey Long, an older one and populists on the right, such as George Wallace, Ron Paul, Pat Buchanan, President Trump himself. Other populists like William Jennings Bryan are, uh, are difficult to classify according to current political taxonomies. Uh, but despite the slipperiness of the uh, terminology, there are two issues that always seem to separate the populist from the non-populist in the United States, and, and those issues are immigration and trade. Why do these issues captivate the populist mindset? And I guess we'll, we'll start with you, Michael, and then go to Sam, since you're on my immediate left. They, it, they can't purely be economics, can it? Well, I don't, I don't I know that I necessarily agree with the premise that immigration always is a, defines populism. Or, was Brian's populism motivated by immigration? I don't recall that. I remember a lot about monetary policy, agriculture, trade, things like that. So why is it a motivating factor now? I mean, well, uh, we have a, a wonderful current headline that almost provided to me for the purpose. Uh, this morning I noticed in the news there's a new Yale study out that says that the number of uh, undocumented or illegal immigrants in the United States, which we've been told for 20 I don't know, 10 or 15 years, it's, it's 11 million or it's 11.3 million. There's this number that's been fixed. Maybe it's 12, 11 or 12, we will say. Notice how over the course of 10 or 15 years, the officials providing that number, it never grows. <laughs> the border hasn't been secured. The wall hasn't gone up. We don't do interior enforcement on employers and things like that, but the number has been supposedly fixed at 11 or 12 million for 20 years, whatever. Yale, that never made logical sense to me. Uh, well, now there's a new Yale study out that says we think it's more like twice that, it, maybe it's 22 million. Well, that's a lot of people, that's not counting illegal immigration, which is at very high levels. So even before you accept the Yale study, if you accept, one accepts the Yale study, we already have official studies saying that the, um, in absolute numbers and as percentage of foreign born, we are as high or perhaps higher than the pre-World War I Ellis Island era peak. Um, with no real change in course in sight. Um, so it seems to me obvious that this would be of concern to a lot of people, and it also seems to me, and has long been obvious, that the leadership in both parties doesn't want to do anything about it. Um, the Democrats are open about not wanting to do anything about it. Uh, half of the Republicans are open about not wanting to do anything about it. The other half lies and says they want to do something about it and then doesn't do anything about it. So. Uh, Clearly, it's a concern, and it's a, it's a neglected concern. Well, one of the things that 
populism, however you want to define it, or in whatever instance that it's cropped up in American history, is it, it arises in response to a neglected concern. It arises in response to an elite consensus that's doing something or preventing something, is either doing something the people don't want or it's preventing something that a broad majority of the people do want and they eventually get fed up and they, they turn to populist leaders who are finally gonna to speak to those concerns. Yeah, thanks Sam. Well, let me talk, uh, Michael talked about immigration, let me refer to the trade issue, which is of course related. One of the things that we noticed up until relatively recently was that there was a consensus among the elites, quote unquote, about the optimal position being one of free trade. Um, that has changed a bit. Interestingly, you find more advocates increasingly on the left now who are saying they're in favor of free trade. I personally think that's because they, th they, it's about being against Trump rather than particularly in favor of trade. That's one thing. But I think the other thing is that uh, something like free trade has become entangled in other questions which rightly generate frustration and anger from uh, normal people. So for example, um, free trade I think has become enveloped in this argument for increased global governance, for supranational institutions, and free trade has become seen as part of that agenda. The advancement of supranational institutions like the European Union, uh, the role played by organizations like the World Trade Organization. And that, I think, is an unhealthy thing for free trade in the first place. But I think it feeds the narrative that free trade is about the elites, it's about those who think they know better than us, those who are contemptuous of nation states and questions of national sovereignty. And that presents some interesting challenges, I think, for conservatives, because conservatives, I think, those, of, those conservatives who are free traders, like Edmund Burke, for example, those conservatives who are free traders, I think, need to think about how they detach the argument for free trade, which economically speaking, I think, is hard to refute. They need to think about how they detach that from this sense that it's all about people who live on the East Coast Corridor or in places like DC, or Brussels. So when free trade gets associated with some of those positions, we shouldn't be surprised that there is a populist reaction against this. Now, I agree. I think populism is a very elastic term, uh, just like liberal order, I think, is often a very elastic term. But until that gets decoupled from this argument about global governance or this move towards global governance that you see in places like Brussels and to a certain extent in places like Washington DC, then I think you're going to have this type of populist reaction. Now, I should also mention, there are short-term losers from free trade, and I think a lot of free traders are often very reluctant to concede that. They point to the overall aggregate benefits of free trade in terms of more choice for lower price, etc. But I think a lot of free traders have made the mistake of saying, well, they'll just be fixed. This is all just going to work out in the end. Well, that's OK, but that's not going to help you if you're a coal miner in West Virginia who's 55 years old and can't move to Silicon Valley and start a startup. This is not just a rhetorical question. There are genuine concerns that I think that conservatives and free traders have not thought about when they're making this type of case. And there's a natural populist reaction to that. Sam, you recently wrote in uh public discourse that free trade made America great in three ways, um, by generating constructive competition and a strong worth ethic, by facilitating the long view of society as against quick fixes to ephemeral, ephemeral problems, and by diminishing cronyism. Um, can you explain these three benefits of free trade in more detail and attempt an explanation for why populists have not rallied to or around them? And then maybe, Michael, I'll ask you to respond to Sam's response. Well, I think I just said some of the reasons why I think that, that what we're calling populism reacts against arguments for free trade. I think I've, I've said some of that. But I think another thing which needs to be taken into account when we're thinking about this trade issue is that uh, one of the things the Trump administration has done is reveal that in many respects, we actually live in a highly mercantilist world. China does not behave like a country that's open to free trade. They're very selective about what they want. They're very um, 
they're changing their, their tariff policies all the time. They cheat, they lie. I think they lie, by the way, about their growth figures as well. I, I just don't believe that what they're saying. We also see the European Union, which of course has abolished uh, tariffs within the European Union, but they've just extended that to the outside borders. So the European Union acts like a big trade block, and we should. So that's the way they're going to behave. And when we see things like free trade, free trade ar arrangements, what we're really talking about are trade agreements. And any of you have seen some of these trade agreements? They're not things like one line saying there shall be free trade between the United States and France. They're this long. Why are they this long? They're this long because these trade agreements are made by governments. They're pursuing often national security questions, which is perfectly reasonable. But they're also governments that are subject to lobbying by particular special interests, businesses, unions who often don't like competition. And so again, I think we need to make a distinction between the real case for free trade and what I call fake free trade, which I think is pretty much prevails around most of the world today. Now that said, I would also go on and say that um, I do think that in the long term, free trade does tend to strengthen a country. And the re one reason I would say that is I think if you look at China today, I think they're starting to pay a price for some of their protectionist policies. We're seeing, for example, if you, go, if you study the Chinese economy, what you discover is not just tariffs against the rest of the world or particular products, there's internal tariffs between provinces even within cities. We're talking about an economy that's highly corrupt, in which the Communist Party, the army, and the state all have their particular interests. And it's very much an example of what you might call a type of mercantilist type of economy. We're seeing what that looks like. But they're paying a price for that now. They're losing their competitive advantage when it comes to cheap labor. Foreign direct, direct investment is starting to decline there. The United States now is number one in the world for foreign direct investment since 2015, 2016. It's no longer China. You increasingly encounter American businessmen who are saying, I'm fed up with dealing with officials in China. This is just not worth it anymore. So I think one of the things about free trade is it does encourage countries to think about long-term questions. My worry with the United States at the moment is that we're moving away from uh, a commercial republic in which self-interest is directed towards things like competition and entrepreneurship. And to a certain extent, we've moved in the direction of what I call crony democracy, whereby self-interest gets challenged, channeled, I should say, towards politics and the maintenance of the political class. There's a reason why outfits like Google and Facebook open up offices in places like DC and Brussels, because they want to lobby. They're not actually interested in economic freedom properly understood. Um, I'm going to go back to something you said at the beginning, or I guess it was in, in the question, that free trade made America great. Is that true? Maybe it made America greater, but um, you know, I, I don't want to riff off of um, Andrew Cuomo blowing his foot off by saying it was never that great. I'm glad he'll never be president now, though. Just let me make that clear. Uh, but America passed a tariff act in the, uh, or immediately after the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, the, um, the vast expansion of the transportation, energy, and so many sectors after the Civil War all happened under the auspices of some pretty severe trade limitations that were specifically intended to build up American industry, even if it raised costs marginally on consumers or on other buyers, certain commodities and other goods. And it, it worked, right? We, we industrialized at, at a very rapid pace. Um, that wasn't without its problems, and environmental problems, problems of wealth concentration and things like that. But it built up domestic industries that uh, were very effective at making the country great, both in the private sector and that enabled uh, the public sector to do things that it wasn't otherwise able to do. Um, you know, we've won, we won wars in part because we had domestic industry capable of you know, building what FDR called the arsenal of democracy. Uh, I, you know, free trade, we've seen, look, I, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but I've had to study it a little bit. We've, we've seen, I'll just give one example of how it can harm the defense industry where the uh, comp comparative advantage certain countries have in producing um, not just commodities, but even parts, even sophisticated parts that you need in your military can bring costs down and it has wonderful benefits for the defense contracting firms, for the government that's spending less money and all of that. But you can get to a point where it becomes impossible for a country, including our country, 
to actually supply and equip its military on its own, or at least only using genuine allies who are not going to abandon you and maybe start embargoing stuff when things get hairy in the international scene. I don't know that that's, even if all of that in the near term when everything is calm, it makes stuff cheaper. That's good that it's cheaper, but I don't know if it's good in the long term. I think there are certain things for national security, just simply for the national interest, that we would want to hang on to and have as domestic industries for political reasons, even if uh, on a pure economic theory that might not you know, make sense. Well, you know, you're, you're leaving two cents on the table every time you do that, or five cents, or whatever it is on the dollar on the table. Okay, um, isn't it better though that some of this stuff remain domestic as essential to what a country is, especially what a country is in the modern era that needs certain industries to defend itself and to um, operate in the modern world? Part of the fusionist project, as it was articulated by Frank Meyer, was to uh, suggest that concepts like liberty and order, uh, the individual and society, were not, in fact, mutually exclusive, that they were uh, at least reconcilable, um, probably, uh, in some cases, mutually reinforcing. We can uh, maybe discuss that in a minute. But uh, I'm wondering if the same can be said about uh, liberalism, conservatism, populism, in, in terms of free trade, I don't know exactly in, in our current vocabularies what, you know, where something like that even falls. We've got a, a, a Trump administration, obviously, that has a different view on trade than the Republican Party has uh, taken in a long, uh, a long time. And uh, I'm just kind of curious, there are a lot of people that are sort of free trade, free market people that, that stay silent on the issue. Um, are, is there a place for fusionism in, uh, in this trade debate? Well, one thing I would say is that while, yes, the Trump administration's position on trade is different than the Republican Party's position, say, over the last 30 years, it's not wholly different from Ronald Reagan's position. Um, people forget Ronald Reagan was willing to stand up for American industry and stand up to other countries. He stood up to the Japanese in a number of ways, um, instituted things that, you know, a modern free trader conservative today would find completely anathema. And that same person in the next breath would, you know, lament how Trump isn't more like Reagan and we need that kind of conservatism again. But if you go back even further, the Republican, the, the older Republican Party, as I noted, you know, Lincoln's Republican Party all the way through McKinley's Republican Party, and um, it was not the party of free trade. Uh, it was the party of, of defending and building up American industry. So Trump, I don't think he's doing this self-consciously saying, I'm reaching back to a, you know, this older Republican tradition. But there's a consistency there that uh, I think a lot of people miss and he doesn't get credit for. And I'll say one other short thing and I'll uh, turn it over. Um, I never understood, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about this until late in the game and Trump made me think about it. Um, you know, I always thought to be conservative means you have to be a free trader because that's just what you learned when, you, when I was growing up. Once you learned you were conservative, you learned that you had to be for free trade. And not, having not studied much economics, I didn't really think about it. And Trump comes along, and I'm, I'm quite uh, intrigued by his candidacy for other reasons, but I'm thinking to myself, bad, but he's, he's all wet on trade. So I went back, and I started to think about it and read some books, or reread passages of books that I had, had read in the past. And the conclusion that I came to was that trade is not a principle. I'm happy to be corrected if anybody thinks I'm wrong, but I, I, I don't, I'm not sure anymore. In fact, I would assert trade whether free or unfree trade is not a principle. It's just a policy, it's just a tactic. When it's good for your country to have a tariff on this or that, then do it, if it's good for your economy and for your political situation. If it's bad, then don't do it. If you're better off with open trade with this or that country, then do that. Don't make trade the end all be all. That's what conservatism did. It said, well, free trade is the end all be all. It's a core principle. Any deviation from it is therefore a deviation from principle. We can't deviate from it. Actually, I don't think that's true. I think the United States, there have been periods when the United States has broadly understood has benefited from trade barriers, and there have been periods when the United States has benefited from freer trade. The obvious example is the post-World War II era. Completely different geopolitical and geoeconomic situation than we face right now, but I having now, I've worked in two administrations in the foreign policy side of things. I cannot tell you how often one hears the almost universal acclaim bordering on adulation for you know, the, the so-called present at creation era of 1945 to 1951, it's still drummed into just about every liberal, conservative, centrist, Democrat, Republican, you name it, that whatever Atchison and you know, John J. McCloy and Kennan were doing right at that moment is for all time. And they were, at that moment, 
for free trade to help rebuild the European economy. So that means that free trade is this bedrock principle of American foreign policy that can never be changed. And if you say otherwise, you're a heretic. Uh, that consensus is still very much alive and it animates, uh, I think, a ton of the massive opposition to Trump from the Republican foreign policy establishment. And I think that consensus is, is wrong. They're mistaking something that was good and necessary for its time with something that is good and necessary for all time when I don't think the latter is necessarily true. Well, a couple of reflections. <clears throat> I think uh, it's worth noting that, yes, free trade is not a principle. Governments do have to actually decide they're going to commit themselves to either a relatively protectionist regime or a relatively open market regime. That's, and today, most countries fall more or less between those things. Adam Smith himself said that it's probably utopian to imagine that the entire world would embrace free trade. He was, well, he was actually speaking about Britain, but if you apply that, and he, he understood that one of the problems with business people, who he did not like, by the way, was because they tended to collude with one another. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is, although it's not a principle in the sense of something that is um, a point of dogma, and I don't, economics I don't think should ever be a point of dogma. It is true that things like comparative advantage are true. You can't get away from the fact of comparative advantage. You can't get away from the fact that the United States, for example, its comparative advantage in manufacturing has declined significantly since 1979 when the population that was employed in manufacturing was about 19 million people. Today, it's about 12 million people. Why is that? Well, partly because of technology, but also because America has lost its comparative advantage in most areas of manufacturing, except highly skilled, highly refined forms of manufacturing. That hasn't meant that suddenly we've got lots and lots of unemployed people all over the place. In fact, we have you know, a very low level of unemployment. It's estimated that something like Manuf tariffs with China cost about 2.4 million jobs between 1999 and 2011. Well, since 2011, we've been adding a net aggregate of 2.4 million jobs every year, which more than makes up for that. So, uh, so th th there's other things that can be said also about the tariff regime. It is true for most of its history, the United States has been a uh, tariff-friendly nation. That did change after the uh, Second World War. But we should also remember that tariffs were initially introduced in the 1790s as a form of revenue raising. That was the primary reason that was implemented. It wasn't so much about protecting industries. That was the language that was used, but it was very much, you didn't have income tax or anything like that. This is how you raise taxes. Uh, and secondly, if you go back and you read, for example, the tariff history of the United States, which was written by F. Talsang in the 1880s, he points out that Tariffs were always a way for this cronyism to become very, very widespread throughout the economy, and that you pay a significant price for that. I mean, there have been histories of the 19th century industrial capitalism in the United States that actually argue that much of the progress was achieved despite the impact of tariffs upon the American economy. So I, I don't see this as a black or white issue. I, I get nervous when I hear people talk about free trade as almost in a religious way, because I think it is very much a policy that needs to be thought about. But I do think that the move away from free trade at the moment, I think, is not actually in the long term going to be in, in the United States' long term interests, partly because of what history, I think, tells us, and also because of there are some basic economic laws that it's very hard to escape from. If you try, you can do that, but I think you start running into the sorts of problems that any mercantilist economy starts to run into at some point. Uh, by May, please, please, please. please. Um, I just, three quick points. I think you're right about the revenue point, but partially right. I mean, Hamilton wrote, if I recall the title of it, it was in the report on American manufacturers, that he wanted tariffs. You know, the, in the great debate between him and Jefferson over the commercial versus the agrarian republic, he thought that in a society at the time that was so overwhelmingly agrarian that had very little manufacturers and had to import things from Europe, he was specifically worried about being dependent on imports from far A, from far away, B, from uh, much richer and more powerful countries, and C, from countries that, that could turn out to be enemies or at least hostile in some way at some point. He didn't want to be dependent on them, and he made an argument 
for tariffs in part to build up a manufacturer, American manufacturers to increase and solidify American independence. Um, the second point I would make, I, I agree, I mean, comparative advantage, Ricardo proves that it's true. It's, it's, it's a law of economics. If, if economics is taken only as in the abstract, the, the question that I would raise, and it's a leading question, and I already have my own answer, is, uh, is there ever anything higher than comparative advantage? Just because comparative advantage is always true, that doesn't mean it's always the highest good. Um, and the third point I would make, when I went back and read some of The Wealth of Nations in 2016, I didn't read it all, it's really quite long, um, but the parts that I did read, Bert, or, um, Smith seems to be very clear that the free trade works best, maybe not only, but best, between countries that are more or less at the same per capita income level and level of technological development, right? Then the theory of comparative advantage is sort of win-win. Everybody's getting what they want, right? The French are better at making wine and the English are better at spinning wool, but it's not as if there's this massive differential between one you know, very rich country with a well-developed sector and another poor country that rises by, um, in a sense, cannibalizing that sector. When you have a differential such as between the United States and you know, China as it emerged from the Cultural Revolution, that's something fundamentally different than what Smith is mostly talking about. And look, whether this always happens in, uh, because of the theory, we know that as a matter of practice what happened is the United States has been the big loser in that relationship, manufacturing-wise and in many other ways, and China has been a big winner. That differential, it, it wasn't a kind of win-win of two countries here, it was more they're down here, we're up here, and it's gone like that in a lot of ways. The only thing I'd say in response is I'm not sure that the decline in manufacturing in the United States has, it has something to do, certainly it has something to do, I think, with the rise of China and their comparative advantage, particularly when it comes to cheap labor. But I think the decline of manufacturing also, frankly, owes a great deal to technology. There's just things we can do with technology now that we don't need. Uh, uh, particular types of manual skills for anymore. And, and that presents a challenge for what you do with people in those, sort, those sorts of situations. But that's not a, not a reason to say, well, let's just keep tariffs in place so we can delay the inevitable from happening in, in the first place. Michael, a question specifically for you. Uh, you recently wrote in the Washington Post that uh, birthright citizenship was a mistake whose time has gone. Did you mean that in the sense that it was a mistake, as in it was an erroneous interpretation of the Constitution, or did you mean that as, as, as a policy matter, that it's a mistaken Both. approach? Okay. Um, well, this is an argument I learned from others, from my teachers, but I'm completely convinced by it, that the framers of the 14th Amendment did not mean to grant birthright citizenship to the children of illegal immigrants or to the children of, 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 of foreigners, broadly understood. Um, you, you, that interpretation is hung on the language of the first clause, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and then they either skip the next clause subject to the ju jurisdiction thereof, or they mistakenly interpret it, I think deliberately mistakenly interpret it. No, that what they meant to do was make completely clear the status of freed slaves. If freed slaves are citizens, they're federal, and that, and that federal citizenship um, supersedes state citizenship. Um, it becomes an issue only much later, and you know, I've been, criticized roundly from all sides for that op-ed and for subsequent defenses that I've made of it, uh, a lot, most of it from conservatives who are outraged, how dare I say anything about birthright citizenship. And one of the arguments that I've found especially amusing is, well, yeah, okay, Anton's probably right that uh, the framers of the 14th Amendment didn't specifically mean to allow what we see going on now. That's just because they weren't thinking about it, because illegal immigration wasn't a problem then. Um, but we're still bound by this non <laughs> intent because of uh, the, you know, the way the law was drafted or something, and so well, we're absolutely stuck with it. It's in the Constitution. So I would say, no, it's not, it's not, it wasn't intended by the framers of the 14th Amendment. You can see that clearly from the debate about it. The subject to the jurisdiction clause means for it, um, means specifically to exclude the children of, of foreign nationals or people who owe allegiance to anyone else or who are not subject to the complete jurisdiction of the United States. These are all lines from the debate. And yet, as a policy, it's obviously it's a bad policy, it seems to me. I mean, this is, I, I can't imagine how you could argue that this is a good policy to say that you could break the law, cross the border illegally, have children here, and uh, the children immediately become citizens and the, with the right down the road to bring whole families over. And as a practical matter, 
um, you know, the children of illegals who, who cross the southern border, the parents don't really ever leave. But here's another, you know, thing that's happening. Did the framers of the 14th Amendment think that, I mean, they didn't foresee the jet age, but the jet age happened. So now we have Russian women fly to Miami and Chinese women, fairly wealthy. I mean, you can't be impoverished and do this. A month before you're going to give birth, spend forty or $50,000 to a so-called um, maternity hotel, have the baby, get a U.S. passport and all the citizenship papers, and then go home knowing that you sort of have an escape hatch. You can come back to the United States anytime you want. Did the framers of the 14th Amendment specifically intend that? You know, that abuse? I think obviously not. And I, I note as well that so many of the conservative critics who have been are just outraged that I brought this up are among the very same people who are certain that the greatest threat to the American security right now is Vladimir Putin and the Russians. I mean, they're certain. Right? It's more dangerous right now than it was in 1983 or 1962. The Russian bear is just about to devour us. So I go, okay, I'll accept that premise. I think it's wrong, but let's accept that premise. Then can we at least cut off the birth tourism from Russian women in Miami if Russia's our greatest enemy? Can, is there any limiting principle you will accept to this? And so far, uh, they haven't gotten back to me. Well, I want to change directions a little bit to the uh, European context. Uh, Michel Houellebecq is a French novelist. He re recently wrote a, a novel called Submission. And uh, this book depicts the rise of a Muslim party with traditionalist patriarchal values that improbably allies with, uh, with the Socialist Party against uh, Marine Le Pen's Front National Party. Um, in doing so, that, that Muslim party, when it comes to, when it rises to power, it, uh, it facilitates the demise of Western, Western liberalism in France. But it raises, the novel raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, one is, people of the right, we'll just, we'll say conservatives, how ought they to approach parties like Marine Le Pen's? Um, is there a connection between the populism we see in the United States and the populism we see uh, among some of the, the nationalist parties that are on the rise in Europe. That's part one of this question. Part two involves Islam and uh, immigration of Islam into uh, Europe and whether um, that is something that conservatives should look at as a threat or an opportunity, Islam being the fastest growing religion in the world. It's a religion of the book. It shares with Christianity a commitment to monotheism and tradition uh, the notion of re revelation and revealed scriptures, a belief in the afterlife and final judgment. Should Christians be trying to form political alliances with Muslims, or should they be perceiving Muslim immigration as a threat? You want me to go first? Okay. I've at it, Sam. Um, <clears throat> this is a question I've written about a fair amount and thought about as well. And there's no question that the European Union's, frankly, irresponsible approach to immigration, uh, I think is doing enormous damage to nation states and the capacity to maintain their sovereignty in the Western Europe. Uh, it's also interesting when you start to study some of the reasons why you have large numbers of Muslim migrants going to Europe. Who are most of these people? Most of them are young single men between the ages of 19 and 30. Why are they leaving their countries? Well, their countries aren't particularly nice places to live, uh, but they're also very aware that if they get into the European Union, uh, then they will just have to answer the questions in the way that the NGO in Turkey tells them to answer the questions. Uh, they, they become eligible for welfare benefits. It's a mess. It's really a very bad way of dealing with this particular issue. The second thing that's part of this, I think, is that the, the Islam immigration question highlights something about the European Union, which is, it's basically a, a project that is devoid of roots in the sense that European Union supranational bureaucrats uh, basically are proposing a model of Europe as this multicultural Kantian rule of law society. They basically, uh, uh, deny more or less the Judeo-Christian roots of Europe and the West, explicitly so. We saw that with the debates about the European Treaty Constitution, which was explicitly refused to reference religion, so to speak. We, you know, we went from the Greeks and the Romans, and then we suddenly arrived at the Enlightenment, and the 1500 years in between was, well, where'd that go? 
Um, and people like Valérie Giscard d'Estaing were, well, that we can't talk about that, because that would violate necessity. So the, the Muslim immigration question, I think, it points to some very existential questions about what Europe and the West understands itself to be. I get more worried about the fact that so many Western European elites are basically in denial of their country's origins, the cultural influences, the roots of the society, because multiculturalism plus mass immigration plus big welfare states is not, is not going to end well. We can see that happening already. Uh, now, as for the, the, the populist dimension, well, if you're a living in a village in Bavaria and suddenly you have a village of 500 people and this is, I'm not making this up, and you have suddenly have 2,000 migrants from Syria and Turkey parked in your village, well, um, you should, be, should not be surprised if people in that village start to get very angry about that. And it points to this disconnect between the European political elites and lots and lots of people, normal people who are not particularly anti-Muslim or anti-migrant, they just want to live peaceful lives and they, they resent what's going on and they feel powerless in the way that they can't, they don't know what to do about it, except by starting to vote for non-establishment parties, which by the way is not necessarily a bad thing because establishment parties in Europe, whether they're on the center right or center left, are more or less indistinguishable from each other on so many questions. So what does that mean for conservatism? It means I think that with some of these new parties, there are aspects of them which I think are good in the sense that they're revolting against an establishment status quo that the establishment will go to the very last barricade to defend, but there's also occasionally nasty elements, like the anti-Semitism that you find on some sections uh, of these, some of these particular movements. So it's a very complicated question, but I do think that it does play into this populism elite discussion that, that so many European politicians are desperately trying to avoid having. Michael, do you have some comments on that? Um, a few, I guess there's a, a writer I don't quote favorably very often because he and I have had our run-ins, but I will this one time, it was Kevin Williamson, uh, and it, he said after one, some major episode in France, in one of the banlieues as they are called, um, this is within, within the last year or two, I think, he said something like, if you don't already have uh, an underclass Muslim population in your cities, why would you want one, right? And the point was, the, uh, these major European cities have shown how difficult, they've had, a, they've, they've had Muslim immigration now for, for, for decades, going back to uh, Algerians in, in going into France in the 60s, going back to the Germans with the guest worker program from Turkey and things, decades and decades and decades, and the integration has been slow at best. You know, some, in, in certain respects you could argue it really hasn't happened at all. Um, so, seeing the problems that have compounded, you know, why would you want to choose that for its own sake, or why would you want to keep it going? But Europe hasn't decided or found the will or whatever to decide that it wants to, now, that it wants to change course. I think, to some extent, that is changing, in part because of the events of the summer of 2015. I think we'll be looking back on the summer of 2015 a long time from now, and Angela Merkel essentially saying to um, all of Syria, and, and beyond, because they have no way of knowing where refugees come from, come on in. Uh, and all at once, there was a million new people in Europe. Um, that shocked public opinion, and the, you know, the things that happened because of that shocked public opinion, and I think it stirred uh, something nascent in public opinion within Europe, but that was on a kind of a low simmer. Uh, it brought the temperature way, way up, the, um, you know, just the, the simple the enormity of the number and the suddenness with which it happened and the consequences that flowed from that. So uh, it's an open question to me whether you know, Europe will, will, will find a way to deal with this problem. I will say this, you know, this is both a, a hopeful sign and a disturbing sign. The countries that are trying to actually stand up the strongest right now, that would be Italy, Hungary, and Poland, are the ones most vilified uh, by Brussels and by elite European public opinion. It's basically, they say, how dare you you know, stand up for your, A, for your individual country, and B, for Europe as a whole. We get to speak for Europe as a whole, and Europe is, you know, universal values without Christianity or however they want to define it. And you guys think, well, Europe means, you know, your country and its distinct history and its past and its people and its territory and all of that, and that's not right. 
Well, that's not what Europe really is. So how that struggle plays out, I don't know. But right now, there does seem to be some, um, um, some pushback from the people. Um, but the elites are not, they're, they're not ready to uh, um, concede that they've made any kind of a mistake at all or that any change course is yet necessary. Yeah, Sam, you want to respond? One thing in relation to your second question about Islam itself, there's a great reluctance in uh, the people who should know better, so to speak, in Europe to think about Islam as a religion. There's an unwillingness to look at things like, well, how, do, how does Islam understand the nature of God? And what you discover very quickly is that the majority position is very much a voluntaristic position. And that raises some big questions about the compatibility of uh, Islam as a religion with societies that, that ostensibly take reason and free will very seriously, because how you understand the nature of God has some very profound implications for how you understand the nature of human beings. And if you have large numbers of people coming into your country, who have various degrees of religious commitment, but nonetheless adhere to a particular religion that's highly voluntaristic, has a, at best, low view of reason, is skeptical about free will, automatically goes from revelation into jurisprudence, rather than Christianity, in Judea, Christianity at least has a very different approach on that subject. But the fact that so many European leaders, and some, frankly, a lot of American intellectuals, especially those, who are in, especially those involved in interfaith dialogue, they refuse to talk about these fundamental things. So if you're going to have lots of Muslim migrants coming in, if you're not willing to have a discussion about some of these theological subjects, it just worsens the situation. Benedict XVI tried to do this in 2005, and look what they did to him. Yeah, I, what you said about jurisprudence, I think, is actually the most important thing, at least the way I look at it. So I had to give a talk earlier this week at a college, and some students were there loaded for bear, ready in the Q&A to quote things that I had written in the past and say, they wanted to say, we got you, you bad man. And one of them asked me a question along these lines. And the answer that I gave, I think they all found shocking. They didn't know how to deal with it. But it's true, as far as I can tell. The jurisprudence question is key. Um, there's no distinction in Islam, as I understand it, between civil and religious law. In other words, what we take for granted is the separation of church and state. But the separation of church and state is on a foundation. Christianity at its inception makes a distinction between civil and religious law. Judaism originally does not, but comes to that position out of, the, out of its own history, which we, don't all, we all know we don't have to go into, um, Islam to this day doesn't make that distinction. So essentially you have, uh, the West has a problem in that a, a fundamental tenet of Western civilization and of Western governance is that religious law is a matter of private conscience and regulation of personal behavior that the state won't necessarily interfere with and that the state may very well respect, but it has no public standing except insofar as it might inform a public deliberation about what moral, you know, what laws regulating morality and personal behavior ought to be. Um, I was going to say orthodox Islam. I don't know that there is any other kind. I mean, there is not like a, you, you can't say that there's this branch and this branch. There are branches based on succession disputes and things like that. But if, if, if a, the fundamentally a faith doesn't recognize a distinction between civil and religious law, then to the extent that people are adherents of that faith, they're going to look at the civil laws of the countries they're in and find them wanting because they will see that those laws don't necessarily, and, and, uh, maybe not much at all, match up with their conception of what the law ought to be. And that will create a tension with um, an existing population and an existing understanding that may be, in fact, centuries old. And not only have, uh, has the West not figured out a way to deal with that, as you pointed out, I think rightly, it just refuses to talk about it. It's just, if you bring it up, you're bad. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I think in the interest of time, we ought to open the, uh, open the, the panel up to questions from the floor. Um, if everyone that has a question would please just line up at the mic and ask them from there. Thank you very much for a, a stimulating uh, discussion, Bob Shadler. Uh, most conservatives would consider themselves originalists with regard to the Constitution. So it's perhaps worth reminding us that the Constitution and virtually all of the framers 
were vehemently against an income tax, both on principle and as a matter of practice. Well, when a government, the equivalent of a free trade ideology conceptually, in its purest form, is the same as advocating a government that doesn't tax anything. That is to say, a government has a role in restricting and shaping goods, services, and information that crosses borders. A tariff is, like, is an equivalent of a tax. It increases the price of something. If you increase the price of something, presumably you get less of it. One of the things the founders were keen on was not simply comparative advantage, but changing comparative advantage. That's what Hamilton was all about. Shaping the skills and abilities of a country so its comparative advantage changes. Similarly, Korea was told by the World Bank, you have a comparative advantage in growing rice. And they also had a comparative advantage in selling wigs internationally. And that was their main export in the 50s. Korea decided to change what they could do best. And now we know that they sell lots of other things. So free trade is really conceptually ideological. And the discussion should be, what is the best prudential policy for a government to pursue to allow citizens, institutions to exchange internationally, but to somehow shape that and in some cases forbid it. My last point in hoping for a reaction. Google has an enormous amount of information about all of us. It would be a very nice price for the shareholders of Google if Google decided to collect all that information and sell it to China at a market price. What would we think of that kind of free trade. Thank you. Reactions, guys? Okay, folks. <laughs> I mean, on your last point, I mean, I can, I can imagine libertarian friends of mine or former friends defending that exact position and saying, absolutely, they have every right to do it. They're a private company. And just like the, as Google and Twitter and Facebook clamp down on speech and increasingly uh, constrict public discourse, uh, you know, all our libertarian friends say, oh, they're private companies and it's the beauty of the market and we shouldn't worry about it at all. And I mean, I've, I've been dissatisfied with libertarianism for a long time, but they sure, boy, are they accelerating my thought process on that front these days. <laughs> uh, I mean, one boy, very quickly though, on the, I may agree with you on the income tax and the founder's original intent, but the, the fundamental problem that you have and that I have is that one way to make something that you don't like consistent with the original intent of the Constitution is to amend the Constitution, which was unfortunately done. And if we want to get rid of it, we got to amend it again. And I don't see much prospect for that in the near term. The only thing I'd add is that uh, free trade can be an ideology. And I, I have libertarian friends as well who will say things like, well, through free trade, we'll have perpetual peace. Everything will be wonderful. Well, I, I point out, well, before... The First World War, a man named Norman Angel, I think his name was, said that the world would never go to war because there was free trade more or less prevailed. Two years later, that didn't quite work out. So it can certainly become an ideology. It can become a part of a narrative in which, in which there's not much reflection about what's actually going on in the level of policy. That said, there are basic economic truths about free trade that I think have been pretty much identified by people like Smith, and particularly with regard to comparative advantage by people like Ricardo. And you are free to accept those or ignore them, but if you ignore them, you should accept that there will be a price for that. Now, if you want to do that, that's a matter, that's a matter for policy, that's a matter for uh, governments to decide. But don't think that you can get away with it without suffering or enduring some of these particular negative consequences. If you want to pay more for less, that's a choice. But don't pretend that that's not going to happen. 
Professor Arbery. All right, Virginia Arbery from Wyoming Catholic College. Um, I'm interested in making connections about Aristotle's teaching on faction, um, which I'm sure our panel knows. His fifth book deals with this fundamental tension between the multitude and the few. And I think <coughs> transfer the one pole, which used to be the oligarchs, to the elites, <laughs> and the multitude toward the many. And so when we're talking about remedying the immoderate tendencies of the many in our day, in, in the context of Europe that you brought up, it, it seems to me that we, we have a real volatile situation because it's not only the framers, the writers of the EU constitution, who like John Paul II said, had no memory, so they construed an identity that was meaningless and empty when they wrote that constitution, but also that the many, though they have some residual sense of what used to be the truths, the tradition that held them together, have no memory either. So what you've got, it seems to me, is volatile prejudice without a moderating force to correct for this emerging popul populism. And I wonder what the answer to that is, because politically speaking, it doesn't seem to me there is an answer to that frustration among the many. Well, I don't know, lucky for me or lucky for you, I just read that yesterday, uh, <laughs> book five of the politics so, and an essay. So did I. <laughs> and an essay thereon, um, reread it. Um, I, I guess my only comment to you there, when you talked about the immoderation of the many, what I see lately is the immoderation of the elites. That's what I've been seeing since 2015 and probably really longer than that. Maybe 2015 is when I really started to pay attention in a hard way. And I see an elite consensus that no matter the more legitimate, moderate objections. I mean, think about I mean, the, the objections being raised to the elite consensus. Can we have a border? That's now considered, I mean, and the, so the Democrats respond to a very moderate demand, not like let's just expel every immigrant or anything, just can we have a border? And the Democrats' response is abolish ICE. So I just see, you know, um, can we, you know, maybe not close every last factory in America? Can we do something about the free trade before the last thing happens? And the elite response is just to push the pedal right to the floor. Um, uh, you know, this is maybe an unpopular thing to say in conservative circles, but the Gini coefficient just keeps going up, up, and up. Wealth concentration, income inequality, wealth inequality keeps going up, up, and up. And by the way, it's not being, con it's, these are not the um, rich Uncle penny bags of the monopoly set, you know, the Republican oligarchs of the 1930s. Uh, wealth concentration is accruing to the left, basically liberals. If you are an elite billionaire in America today, 99 to 1 chances that you're a Democratic voter, donor, uh, liberal activists, right? And, and the elite answer to any kind of pushback to that is, no, no, more of the same, and we're going to demonize anybody who brings up. Aristotle says, factional conflict arises from also when the oligarchs become arrogant and immoderate and want to increase their power and further lord it over the many. That's what I've been seeing going on the last few years, and that's what Trump is a, in large part a pushback to. I would like if it were possible for somebody like me or anybody in this room to persuade the elites to just back off a little bit, I think that would be very good for American politics. But so far, they're not listening. They're certainly not listening to me. The only thing I'd add to that is on the immoderation of the elites. Of course, in, in the European Union, I think it's, if anything, it's maybe even worse. What is the standard response of Jean-Claude Juncker every time there's a, there's a pushback against deeper integration. What's his response? We need more integration. Every time. It's the standard response. And the naked contempt which you find on the part of centre-left, centre-right politicians in the European Union, in the European Parliament in particular, to anything that goes against their consensus. It's not as if they're interested in having a serious argument. What they do is they say to think people like I think Marine Le Pen this week, who had some, was, um, had some comments about Islam, she was referred for psychiatric treatment, right? So, and I think also, I mean, uh, uh, Michael mentioned the 2015 decision of uh, Angela Merkel to say, hey, come on in, we'll take care of you, we've got lots of money, we're German, we're feeling guilty. 
Um, I can't think of any single factor that probably played a bigger role in lots of people in Britain, including one third of Labour Party voters, deciding we are out. We are out because we can't control our borders now. Richard. Um, hi, uh, Rick Nathan. Uh, so I, I think as conservatives, we recognize the power of the free market. So this idea that trade between individuals without government uh, interfering. So trade just governed by supply and demand is valuable. And uh, my question is, do we make a mistake when we conflate free, uh, free trade with free markets? Uh, um, because um, when you look at trading with China, there is government involvement necessarily in that interaction. The government's you know, involved to the point of, of IP theft by the state and giving it to Chinese corporations. So my, my question is, is there anything inherently free market about free trade in that situation? And um, the, uh, the other issue is when we make a moral argument against uh, or for free trade, are we not really saying that you know, it's okay for the Chinese government to be involved in that interaction between me and a third party, but it's not okay for my government to, to try to mitigate that. Uh, well, when nations engage with, when nations engage, with, engage with tra in trade with one another, as far as I know, there's, there's may, what is it, maybe Hong Kong, a couple of other countries in the world that are pretty much more or less open completely economically. So what you are dealing with is effectively degrees of tariffs, degrees of protectionism. In the United States, the average trade uh, tariff rate, I think, is less than 4%. And what you're talking about are concentrations of tariffs on particular sections of the American economy. And when you're dealing with China, of course, you're dealing with multiple levels. You're really dealing with a mercantilist state. So. Uh, is it a level playing field? Well, not in the sense that the Chinese are clearly involved in all sorts of manipulation of markets. We know they steal intellectual property. That's been mentioned several times. Um, but is that a reason for the United States to adopt similar policies? And I would argue no, because I think that actually hurts Americans on all sorts of different levels. They may not see it immediately, but in the long term, I think uh, they will. So you're right, we're not talking about a, a perfect free trade world. Uh, we're not talking about when it comes to China or the European Union for that matter, that they're behaving in a free market fashion. Uh, but I do think it's much better for the United States to proceed on the grounds that it's better to trade in some way with these countries uh, and to be as, make the United States as competitive as possible because those tariff protections and all those things that the Chinese do in the long term, I think, they can't compete with an open, dynamic, competitive economy. And if you want to talk about making the American economy uh, stronger in a position, better able to compete with countries like China, then lower taxes, which Mr. Trump has done, lower corporate taxes, which Mr. Trump has done, uh, deal with the regulation problem, which I think is one of the things that the Trump administration has done, and that's one of the things that not many people are talking about, deal with our welfare state, deal with our entitlements programs, et cetera. Hi, I'm Chris Wolf, and I had a, the same question, but I wanted to express it kind of more in an abstract way. Uh, I was intrigued by the question, is free trade a principle? And I was um, thinking about it, and for libertarians, it seems <laughs> definitely yes. I mean, their philosophical anthropology that might be the only principle that we're choosing beings, and that's about it, in a thin philosophical anthropology. But for conservatives, um, I'm wondering how does free trade relate to, say, natural law or natural rights that we might uh, uh, believe in? I think, well, take a stab at that. Uh, for conservatives, for the American founders, for instance, uh, a, you know, a it is a fundamental right to utilize the fruits of your own labor, to sell it you know, without interference by government, and to be able to sell either your labor, the fruits of your labor, and so on, subject to reasonable taxation such as necessary for the function of necessary operations of the government, especially the ability to secure rights and the physical safety of, uh, without which you couldn't r ever realize the fruits of your own labor. So. You could extend that point outward to say anything that distorts a trading environment is somehow against this natural right to utilize the fruits of your own labor. 
However, we've already had to concede one point, right? Which is we're gonna tax you because if we can't tax you, we can't govern the physical space you're in, we can't secure your rights, and the whole purpose of government is to secure rights and to provide physical safety, or at least that's the foundational purpose. And if you can't do that, you can't utilize your labor. So you're, in a, you're already in a, a circle there that you can't get out of. So we've already admitted a limiting principle. And then to me, from that point on, I, I would say, all other things being equal, a natural rights understanding would say, you want trade to be as free as possible, consistent with the national interests. And if there are times in which the national interests, in which the common good, the collectivity, are gonna benefit from certain restrictions, even if it um, reduces income, or it makes certain things more expensive, and so on, it's justified. Uh, uh, and I think that's, you know, the founders really didn't have a problem with that, and they, I think, had a firmer grasp of that principle of natural right and what the, you know, what the right to enjoy the fruits of one's labor, possess, acquire, and sell property. I think they had a firmer grasp of that, maybe not than all of us in this room, but certainly than of modern society in 2018 did, and they didn't have a problem with it. So that's one of the reasons why I find it um, incongruous to hear modern conservatives over and over again say, you know, free trade is this bedrock principle that's tied to natural right, and somehow, well, you know, the very men who wrote our natural rights charters didn't quite see it that way. Maybe they, maybe they knew something that we've forgotten or it's become distorted over the years. Can I say something about that from a natural law standpoint? Uh, I was writing an article last week about um, of Emile de Vattel's The Law of Nations, which was actually very influential in quite a number of American founders. And that book is very interesting because it does articulate more or less a natural law case for economic freedom, and more or less along the lines that Michael described with some variations. But it also talks about the, that it's not an absolute. How could it be an absolute? There are more important things than economic, economic liberty is very, very important. It's hard to have a free society without economic liberty, but economic, it's not enough. And there are, and Vettel says that there are lots of circumstances in which you can contemplate uh, governments taking action that are perceived to be in the interest of the common good and the national interest or what he calls the public interest. And that's more or less the consistent position you find throughout the natural law tradition. What's interesting about the natural law tradition on this subject is when they're identifying limits, the reason they're identifying limits is partly because of the questions of the common good, but also because there's this sense that we have to put down limits on what the state can do in this area. Because if we let the state do too much in this area, pretty soon we'll see economic liberty start to be gradually extinguished. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Kelly from uh, UT Dallas. Uh, I have a fairly unpopular opinion in this room, I think, but uh, I'm quite disappointed with the discussion on Islam. Um, so Aristotle was discussed uh, a little bit in this Q&A. Uh, you know, we have the Arab Muslims to thank for the fact that we can actually even read Aristotle today. Um, you know, no, I think you're just, just another, what's that? They, but anyway. Just another, just another, you know, anecdotal, but you know, uh, uh, Adam Smith uh, was, you know, very much inspired by Ibn Khaldun many of his, his example of the pin factory, you know, displaying the, uh, the, the advantages of the division of labor is, you could say, it found its origin in a, in a Muslim scholar. So the idea that, that Islam has a low opinion of reason, I think it's kind of ridiculous, frankly. Um, as, and you know, the, if you look at how uh, uh, Muslims have been assimilated and integrated into American society, and you compare it with how that's occurred in Europe, I think it says a lot more about the differences between the American model and the European model than it does about Islam. So, and actually, and it says something about the virtues and the resiliency of our institutions. So, that's my main point. I mean, it, just, just also though, I, like, uh, so I'm an I Irish Catholic, right? And I think, you know, when we talk about uh, the relevance and importance of Abrahamic traditions to the Western, to Western civilization, um, you know, just a, so people from my homeland in, in, in uh, uh, Catholic Ireland uh, are, you know, to a large extent responsible for developing a lot of the, uh, in, in the IRA I'm talking about, 
uh, you know, developing the terrorist networks, which uh, in many ways they were the progenitors of a lot of the Islamic terrorism that we see today. So where does that, where does that contradiction kind of fit into the story that Islam is somehow fundamentally um, anti-liberal? I just don't see it. Well, first of all, I think you mistook Plato and Aristotle. To the best of my recollection, the Islamic scholars didn't save Aristotle. That was mostly saved in the Western Latin tradition. They, but they did save a lot of Plato that was unknown to the West. Until, and it's the other way around. Until the late Middle Ages or the early modern era, but we can leave that to one side. Look, I've got Averroes, Avicenna, Farabi. I can name any number of Muslim authors I have on my shelves that I read in grad school, profited from. It's wonderful. I, I, I mean no disrespect to Islam as a civilization. I've been to Islamic countries. I've been impressed by the architecture, by the people, and so on. It, it, but that's not a basis on which to make public policy. Um, either the, the, the wonders of certain philosophic books or even you know, the beauties of a given country and the hospitality of the people or things like that. You have to make public policy on what's good for a given population within a country at that time, given the problems it's facing. I think you're certainly right that the experience of Muslims in the United States is better than, or the, the, the experience of the United, works both ways, of Muslims in the United States and of the United States with Muslims is better than it is in Europe. Partly that's due to owing to um, a different conception of nationalism, with Americans' nationalism is much more a civic nationalism than European nationalism, which is much more blood and soil. Um, partly it's due that America just has a, a strong historical, centuries-long record of being able to take newcomers from various parts of the world and assimilate them. Partly, but also due, uh, and this part is important, to numbers that are very different in, in two senses, right? Um, both in terms of the population that one is trying to integrate and the surrounding population is a lot larger. So if you're a country of, making this up, but if you're a country of 50 million and you have a minority of 5 million, 10%, that's a very different thing than if you're a country of 300 million and you have a minority of 1 million. Um, all of those factors work together to make the experience different. I totally agree with that. But one has to look forward on the basis of what one sees going on and I'll just, I'll close with an anecdote. So I, I said I gave a talk earlier this week and I got a question sort of like that one at the end. And uh, I gave the answer I gave about civil and religious law. I went on at some length, but I won't do now. I'm tracing it from the ancient city, the pagan ancient city to Judaism and Christianity and so on and forward. And afterward, um, a, a Muslim student came to me and said, she said, essentially, well, I agree with you that, um, yeah, there are no imams or, or scholars or clerics sort of preaching this idea of a separation of civil and religious law and making the religious law a matter of private conscience. She said, but that's the way American Muslims live their lives in practice. And isn't that enough? I said, that's great. That's what it should be. But um, there's, a, you know, when there's a worry. You know, we're always told about homegrown radicalization. Usually, a lot of times immigration advocates mean that to say, well, you shouldn't worry about the immigrants. They're not a problem. And these latest guys who went off the rails, they were born here. Well, where does homegrown radicalization come from? I, in part, I think it comes from there is no, there's no superseding doctrine. There's no, you know, after 9-11, we were told often, often and off again and again, Islam needs a reformation. And there were all kinds of non-Islamic Western scholars raising their hands saying, I'll do it. That wasn't going to work for obvious reasons. But if it, if what I'm not seeing and what I think would be helpful is those Muslims that that student was talking about who do live their lives, and practice respecting the civil law and treating the religious law as a matter of private conscience and personal practice, uh, I think they need a theory or they need a doctrine to be, a, you know, to follow from the top, that it's not going to work if it's just, because, because according to, you know, uh, a, a very serious cleric or scholar of Islam, those people are not living in accordance with the teachings as they're supposed to be. They would, they, they would and do condemn that as a matter of practice. And it's a problem that they don't have, um, senior authoritative scholars and clerics vouching for what they do. I think that is a problem.